Welcome to the Batch and BACAF Population Health Management mini module, which is part of the Improving Services series. Before we start, let's recap the main points of the NHS long term plan. It talks about cooperation and collaboration rather than competition and contestability between different organisations. It puts patients at the centre of all planning and delivery, reinforces clinical system leadership, embeds quality improvement within the system which is designed around pathways and networks and is the basis for successful integrated care. Indeed those terms are used many times throughout the document. I believe community paediatricians are fundamental to the implementation of new ways of working particularly between community child health and primary care and community child health and hospital based secondary care. I could probably talk for an hour on each of these bullet points but today I want to focus on the last bullet point, population health management. Population health management is important because it starts to tackle some of the determinants of health which traditionally the NHS has had little responsibility for and yet as we all know has a huge contribution to play in terms of improving the equity of outcomes. A focus on prevention should ultimately deliver better value and reduce health service demand but our focus today will be on improving outcomes. What I would like to do today is give you some ideas about population health management and how it might be applied to services for children and families. This is an interactive talk with four breaks where I will ask you to think about particular issues. Wherever possible I will try and build on what I assume is your current knowledge and hopefully we will end up with some practical steps forward. Let's start by thinking about the meaning of population health management and why it should interest you. In groups of three you have three minutes to come up with three important points. The word population must make sense to the users of services providers of services, commissioners of services and policy makers and can be interpreted in at least four different ways. All are relevant to population health management and it is essential that the population under consideration is clearly defined to all concerned. First there are patient groups which are populations that make clinical sense. Typically they are a group of individuals receiving care within the health system or organisation for example patients with liver disease or patients over a certain age. Then there are organisational groups which are patients attending a particular hospital or clinic or primary care centre or even children attending a particular school. Community groups are often population segments unified by a common set of needs or issues for example living in poverty or poor housing or a demographic with shared characteristics. Then there are geographical populations which are groups within a specifically geographically bounded area on which the program is based for example CCG, local government boundaries, defining immunisation or screening programmes and there are many others. Segmentation and stratification are important concepts within population health management. Stratification is essentially organisation by one group characteristic and is a continuous variable. Examples would be social status by income or centile by height. Segmentation is organisation by individual characteristics for example by disability or hair colour and in statistical terms it's a categorical variable. We all remember the WHO definition of health which is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and is not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Population health is used interchangeably with the term health of the population and considers various components of health including the distribution of health related determinants both positive and negative and the exposure to these determinants disease and conditions that arise within the population, service outcomes and the equity of those outcomes within and between populations and finally quality of life of the population or a subgroup under consideration. Population health is therefore defined as the health outcomes of a group of individuals including the distribution of those outcomes within the group. 
These groups are often geographic populations such as nations or communities but can also be other groups such as employees, ethnic groups, disabled persons, children or any other well-defined group. It's important to define health in both positive terms and avoiding the trap of defining health only in terms of treatable disease. Finally we come to the management element of population health management. Management can divide it into measurement, analysis and action and I would also like to include creation of learning organisations here. The concept and practicalities of population health management are still evolving. This definition from Kindig is probably the most comprehensive. Population health management focuses on the interrelated conditions and factors that influence the health of populations over the life course. It identifies systematic variations in their patterns of occurrence and applies the resulting knowledge to develop and implement policies and actions to improve the health and well-being of those populations. This definition has been criticised as not specifically mentioning health service roles in both prevention and intervention to improve health, hence the term sometimes of population medicine. Population health management is therefore evolving. The importance of population health has been recognised by the public health community for more than a century, but the more recent resurgence of interest in the management elements relates more to reducing health service costs by decreasing health service demand and improving outcomes by taking a more holistic approach to health service delivery at a population level, especially involving the focus on equity of outcomes and tackling health determinants. In some ways population health management puts the health back into the NHS rather than it merely being an illness or injury service. The World Health Organization describes health system management as being the activity undertaken by all organizations with the primary intent to promote, restore or maintain health. In this slide we have health outcomes on the top of the vertical axis. The contribution played by health behaviours, clinical care, social and economic factors and the physical environment are in the central column with more detail in the right hand column. Population health management starts with the recognition that clinical care provides no more than 20% contribution to overall health outcomes judged by length and quality of life. Health behaviours, social and economic factors together with the physical environment contribute the remainder these are all health determinants. The NHS long-term plan encourages clinicians to consider these determinants of health when making individual plans with patients to manage their conditions in the new integrated health systems. The intention is to start being able to tackle relevant health determinants as well as provide clinical care. The intentions for population health management would include reducing death and improving the quality and duration of life. It also includes improving the quality and safety and effectiveness of services and therefore reducing inequalities relating to both service and life course pathways. And in this resource constrained system improving the per capita cost of care which means increasing value. There are various interpretations of population health management within the NHS long term plan. I think these three statements cover the major concepts. First, the integrated health systems will match resources to population health based need. The focus will be on patient groups already known to the NHS, but the NHS will also contribute to tackling health determinants at a population level for groups not yet known to the health service, in other words, primary prevention. The concepts behind population health management are well captured in this quote from Michael Marmot. Why treat people and send them back to the conditions that made them sick? This is an important but complex slide. It tries to explain how different exposures to health determinants have an effect on health and social status in a stepwise manner. In the left hand column are the health determinants and the exposure to that determinant. Within the whole population there is differential exposure, meaning some are exposed and some are not, to a particular health determinant. Of those who are exposed there is then differential effect, meaning that some are affected and some are not. 
so some go on to experience health problems and some do not. Finally, there are differential consequences. Not all experiencing a health problem go on to experience comorbidities or disadvantage resulting from that health problem. In very simple terms, an example would be burns from open fires. Only a small proportion of housing has open fires. An even smaller proportion have no fire guards. Direct contact with fire is a health hazard causing burns. Primary prevention would be to replace open fires with central heating. Secondary prevention would be encouraging the use of fire guards and tertiary prevention would include early burn management through cooling and later hospital based burn management. This also introduces the concept of population shrinkage which merely means that interventions aimed at tertiary prevention will only benefit the very few whereas primary prevention potentially benefits the many. Some health determinants can have both positive and negative effects. This illustration is an oversimplification of the mechanism of action of vitamin D relating to rickets. In the whole population of children there will be differential exposure to sunlight. Some will be at risk of developing sunburn, whereas others will be at risk of rickets. Children with dark skins living in the northern hemisphere will be at even greater risk of vitamin D deficiency. For some children, dietary intake of vitamin D and calcium plus inadequate amounts of sunlight will result first in biochemical rickets and then later osteomalacia. Of this group, some will receive timely and adequate treatment and will not develop secondary complications of osteomalacia in terms of bone deformities. Primary prevention protects healthy people against the disease. Secondary prevention screens people at higher risk for the disease or with the disease in an early stage and then offers treatment. Tertiary prevention treats and rehabilitates patients with the disease. Now let's think about health determinants in your clinical practice. In groups of three, you have three minutes to come up with three common determinants that you recognise. Here I need to introduce the concept of upstream and downstream determinants and macro and micro interventions, simply because they are often used in the literature. I cannot find a reference for the original use of the concept, but it is that if you fence off deep water and teach people to swim, these are considered upstream interventions, whereas providing life belts and emergency services are downstream interventions. A more modern analogy would be to prevent river flooding, you need to tackle climate change to reduce exceptional and severe weather conditions, with reforestation to prevent excess water runoff from hills, and improve infrastructure around rivers to prevent flooding. These would all be macro upstream interventions. Downstream interventions would include protecting housing from floodplains, emergency evacuation procedures and compensation to rebuild homes and lives after flooding. Generally upstream interventions tend to be on a population basis or macro where downstream interventions tend to have a more individual focus and are micro interventions. But there are exceptions in both directions. I have included this slide simply to acknowledge and hopefully clarify the semantic confusion that exists within the current literature. The upper table has upstream interventions on the left and downstream interventions on the right and the alternative words underneath to describe where the intervention is targeted. I will generally use the word population determinants for those that act at a group level and personal determinants for those that act at an individual level Clearly there is some interaction between population and personal, the most glaring example being that of poverty, which is a political choice which then limits many personal decisions. The bottom table contains alternative words for the concepts of positive and negative. The left-hand column promotes health whereas the right-hand col column undermines health. Everyone will be familiar with pathogenic but less familiar with salutogenic, which is the opposite. I have stressed the importance of promoting positive determinants and protection from negative determinants, but once again there are many different words to illustrate the range of determinants.
In this paper I've used resilient and vulnerable when talking about children, promoting and protecting when talking about families, assets and hazards when talking about agents, and positive and negative for the environment. But I have to confess that sometimes I'm inconsistent. Let's look at some examples. I will just take one or two examples from the next two slides. You can argue that poverty could be tackled on a population basis by ensuring a living wage rather than a minimum wage or raising tax thresholds. On the other hand, providing benefits, food banks and debt counselling could all reduce the burden on poverty on individuals and are downstream interventions. Likewise, providing nutrition could be achieved by providing food subsidies for healthy foods or banning food advertising for unhealthy foods at a population level or free healthy school meals for those on benefits or food vouchers for fruit and vegetables as downstream interventions. A similar approach can be taken for specific groups. For example, smokers, by increasing the taxation of tobacco products versus smoke stop programs to tackle individual nicotine dependency. An ex another example would be creating safe routes to school for active travel on a population basis and promoting helmet use and cycle training on an individual basis. This is a slide from Neil Halfon and mimics a growth chart. On the vertical axis there is readiness to learn and on the horizontal axis there is age. The top three blue lines represent the 5th, 50th and 95th centiles. The two lower orange lines describe the effect of neglect and below that delayed or disordered trajectory. The labels in both blue and yellow show the influence of determinants at different life stages, ranging from poverty through to family discord. Superimposed on top of these more continuous determinants, children can also experience adverse child events at single points on their trajectories, for example the loss of a parent through death or divorce. What is missing conceptually is exposure to positive determinants, sometimes called assets, which improve life course outcomes including readiness to learn. This diagram illustrates the same message. You will have seen it in the life course mini module. This time we have quality of life on the vertical axis and duration of life on the horizontal axis. The three circles show the interaction between population determinants, individual determinants and health services. If they are all positive, the trajectory is along the upper line, which also achieves longer life, whereas individuals exposed to negative determinants follow the lower line. The difference is the quality adjusted life year gap, and I will return to this issue of equity of outcomes later. Now let's look at the roles of the NHS for population health management starting with downstream or individual interventions. In terms of personal or individual interventions the expectation is that the NHS will continue to support and advocate for individuals to help them tackle those determinants that are relevant to them as individuals or the disease or condition from which they suffer. This is all part of personalised proactive and preventative care and best condition management which also contributes to reducing inequalities of health outcomes. Delivering safe and effective care to the whole population with a particular emphasis on achieving equitable outcomes for the more vulnerable subgroups in the population they serve is probably the most important element of care the NHS can provide for the patients they care for. The NHS also has a role in contributing NHS data to population health needs assessment to identify groups or communities that can benefit from population health management approaches. As I said at the beginning of this mini module, the focus has been on a clinical approach to tackling health determinants on a patient population basis. This is a largely downstream approach, but there is a huge potential for greater upstream approaches to identify and intervene with at-risk groups who may or may not be known to the NHS. This will re require the ability to map and analyse data from multiple sources both relating to health determinants and their effects at a population level. The next step would then be to plan, implement and evaluate interventions which m may range from safe play spaces, better active travel infrastructure, 
improved social housing or access to libraries in more deprived areas. Clive Hertzman's work with the, in Vancouver with the Human Early Learning Partnership provides some good examples. The NHS is also what is described as an anchor organisation, meaning an organisation that has a significant influence within a local economy. The NHS touches millions of lives every day, both as a direct provider of care and as an employer and as a partner with other organisations providing health care. The NHS therefore had a, has a leadership role and a responsibility to de demonstrate both social value and to improve environmental sustainability. Prevention through addressing health determinants should therefore be an integral part of NHS culture and action. Examples might include reducing the NHS carbon footprint, generation of local energy, reducing travel for both staff and patients, local food, food procurement wherever possible and reducing all forms of waste as described in the document Delivering a Net Zero NHS. Let us now start thinking about the positive actions you might be able to implement. Once again in groups of three let's have three good ideas. So what can you do? As a clinician your primary role is to ensure the best management of conditions and prevention of comorbidities with a greater focus on the causes of the problem. As Michael Marmot said, why send children back to the conditions that cause the problem? So first, think about the determinants relevant to the individual family or the condition or the child. This might include asking whether it's difficult to make ends meet, how much time parents spend reading to their child or whether domestic violence is an issue. Then second, learn about local resources that can help address health determinants. An afternoon finding about local food banks, debt counselling, childcare and play schemes during the summer holidays will enable you to give practical advice. The Bill Help well website is a very useful start to discovering local resources. Third, work in partnership with families to create a realistic care plan to improve both the health of the child and family functioning. Acknowledging that life is difficult for some families and understanding the reasons why is an important first step to tackling health determinants. Advocating on behalf of individual families with local services. Some services require a health service referral, but sometimes families don't want to make demands while others can't engage for practical reasons such as transport or time off work. Paediatric and child health departments can contribute to population needs assessment, analysis and evaluation. Child health departments hold information on everything from birth weight to child health promotion uptake rates, waiting times for clinics and the incidence and prevalence rates for various clinical conditions. These figures can then be supplemented by Public Health England fingertips data, local hospital data and potentially data from the local authority to create a comprehensive picture of the health or ill health of children in your area. Identify the health determinants that have most impact for your patient groups. This needs to be thought through carefully as data is not always available and when it is available how can it be used to best effect? For example, can it be used to monitor the impact of interventions? Integrate prevention within all pathways of care. Often the prevention of comorbidities is overlooked when commissioning care, but monitoring of preventable comorbidities, whether this be in ASD or diabetes, should be an integral part of the QI process. Work with community providers uh, to address the wider issues identified. Many of the problems identified will be outside the immediate remit of the NHS. Obser obesity being an example where the NHS has a clinical role but can also actively promote healthy eating and interventions such as growing food, food co-ops, food skills and better food choices in schools. This is just one example of innovative practice. Hannah Zhu was a paediatric registrar working in a paediatric assessment unit where she recognised that the majority of patients she was seeing were from lower socio-economic backgrounds. Despite this, none of her colleagues asked about poverty during clinical history taking.
She designed a set of questions suitable for asking about poverty and then implemented them using three PDSA cycles and then reviewed the notes. Asking about poverty moved from 0% to 80%. One of the reasons why clinicians did not ask about poverty was that they felt helpless in knowing what to suggest. So one of the key points was developing an information sheet about local and national resources that clinicians could use with parents. This is included on the next slide. While this is particularly relevant to her local work area of work, many of the resources here work at a national level. I would recommend exploring the Bill Help website. This is a good example of tertiary prevention helping individuals living in poverty reduce the impact of poverty. This is an overview slide describing the four stages when planning population health management interventions. The starting point is always about being clear about the purpose. Which populations will be served, by which systems, what will change, the costs and how will it be sustainable. The next step is bringing knowledge to the proposal. Who will benefit? What are their needs? What are the interventions? How will outcomes be measured? And what are the expected variations that contribute to equity? Next, will this be a single intervention at one moment in time or a program of multiple interventions over time? Which determinants will they tackle? What outcomes will change? And what will be their expected impact in the real world? Finally, what impact did the intervention have on the whole system? What are the implications for future workforce planning? What barriers had to be overcome and what incentives were found to be useful? Or in other words, what advice would you give to spread good practice? Finally, let's recap why paediatricians should be interested in population health management. Tackling the downstream determinants will help improve the experience of care, improve outcomes and contribute towards reducing health inequalities. Tackling the upstream determinants on a population basis will, over time, improve population health and hopefully reduce demands on the NHS improve equity and increase value derived from public services. Thank you. I would welcome comments or questions on the content of this presentation which should be viewed alongside the batch and BACAF paper entitled NHS Long Term Plan. What does population health management mean for services for children and families?